Well, three years ago when we started this off, you guys remember that? that uh, oh, this is nice. Ooh. Three years ago, we started off with that clip. If you were here three years ago, stand up. Let's just, let's just get a look. How many of you have actually made it through all three turns of this adventure? Wow, that's a good job. All right, you can sit down. That's all the love you're going to get. Oh, yeah, harmonizer. Let's see. If I keep looking, I find it. And the only thing smaller than that is dreamer. But I didn't know why people made me angry until I took that test. You know, so uh, that was all really interesting. Uh, you know, I hadn't been up here a lot this year, but I'm looking forward to coming back next year. I told Tim at the beginning of the year, I said, man, I got a family in crisis. I'm going to be marginally beneficial to be around, but I'll, uh, I need to go just because I need to be plugged into my small group. I need to come and I get remotivated every week. And I made it when I was in town. Uh, but, you know, the one thing I hate about people that will take a leadership position and assume some kind of mantle of, well, you know, I'll, I'll be your MC, is uh, plasticity. And so I've not tried to hide from you that we have had the worst year in the history of my life. It's been awful. I actually, you know, I, I told some, some of you have heard me talk a little bit about this. I actually thought it might be an easy year. The last two or three years were a little hard. We did, you know, we had a lot going on at work. And uh, that was relatively stressful. And um, then we moved out of that. And I thought, well, good, it'll be nice to kind of have a kind of a quiet year. And I'll think about what I want to do next. And, uh, and then, you know, all Hades broke loose. And so I thought. So I thought. So, uh, you know, I've had, one, I've had one kid in drug rehab all summer. And uh, when you've when you got one kid in drug rehab, who's in drug rehab? We're all in drug rehab. The whole family's in drug rehab. So we went through all of that, and it was brutal. And I thought, I thought it was the worst thing I'd ever been through. And then uh, Dee Dee and I stayed plugged in. You know, I've never lied about this. We've lived in marriage counseling. We've been married 26 years. We just, I think we stay married so we can go to the marriage counselor. That's a joke. But... <laughs> We stayed plugged in post all of the family week, uh, family work and family week that we had done with our, our oldest kid who went through this tragedy of prescription drugs. The younger two brothers didn't get drugged through it. You know, uh, hey, uh, uh, I thought we were okay. He's not okay. You don't seem to be doing okay. She doesn't seem to be doing okay. Maybe, am, am I okay? You know, natural questions that flow out of that. And so I was quite convinced that, uh, that personality tests and things of that nature would be interesting, but not, not critical to getting through the year. So I said, you know, I'll come, I'll be there, I'll finish, I'll, go, I'll walk the last 50 yards, but when I get to the summit, you know, I'm just turning around and walking back down. And that's, you know, it's kind of really where I was. You can make allowances or not. I have a wonderful set of internal boundaries. I don't really care. <laughs> but <laughs> I've learned that. <laughs> but here's what, I wanted to, here's what I just wanted to let you know. It has also been the most amazing, spirit-filled, cleansing, renewing, positive thing that's ever happened in my life. Only a good God would have turned what was a complete wash into something that was ex not only good, but wonderful. At this point in time, now looking back over the last year, I wouldn't trade anything for what I went through and what our family's gone through. Today, Dee Dee and I are closer than we've ever been in our lives. And we've been together since we were 18. My oldest son is coming up on his ninth month clean and sober next week. He's doing fantastic. He went to every class. He's at Pepperdine in California. He went to every class through midterm semester. Y'all are like, oh, I always went to class. <laughs> well, the Fords don't go to class part, <laughs> or some of them don't. Uh, that's a, that was a major milestone for him. He's doing terrific. The two younger brothers are thriving. 
Joe's gotten accepted into Vanderbilt. Will is doing fantastic, but as long as there's a sport with a ball involved and someone to text with, he's a happy camper. That's all out here, though. What's happened on the inside has been absolutely phenomenal. Um, and I want to share it with you next year. Uh, Tim's going to talk a little bit about what we're going to do and what the program will be next year. It's going to be, I think, a little different than what we've been doing. And I'm looking forward to going through that with you at, at that point in time. Um, but I would like to just say something that uh, finally resonated with me. So if, you're, uh, if you are a, a what, what do you call it, an energizer persister. So I'm an energizer and I'm a persister, which means, you know, I'll fight until one of us dies or until I find something better to do. That's basically, that's basically what that translates in. I don't know if you knew that. Uh, then, you know, over the last 15 years, so Dee Dee asked me when I took this, she said, uh, did you learn anything new? I said, no, not really. Um, I, I am what I am. I've been, I took personality, I took this same personality test 15 years ago in an earlier bout of marriage counseling. No, it was a community group deal. Uh, and, and some of the in, in, interim categories had increased because I had to learn to manage, you know, different situations, different personalities. So I'd had to kind of stretch a bit. Uh, but my youngest son, just, just to kind of give you a, where, where did this come in handy? My youngest son is a dreamer. I mean, my oldest son is a dreamer. I'm 6% dreamer, which means I can stand it for about 60 seconds before I become physically agitated. Really? We sit down and start having these dreamer conversations. And I'm like, okay. Yep, 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 yep. All right. Since we've had this conversation 12 times before, I think we can make a list of what we need to do about it. Well, man, that just kills his heart. Killed his heart. You see it? So you can see how at the end of the day, all of this kind of personality stuff and love languages, you know, I've read the love languages. Five, I've read that book, The Five Love Languages. I've read it three times, and I still don't get it. Does anybody else, has anybody else had that experience, or has everybody read that book and go, oh, yeah, now my life makes perfect sense and my wife makes perfect sense? Does anybody else, I want to know, just raise it, will cameras will stay up. One, two, three, four. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, brother. Be honest. Yeah. Five love languages of every life. It's a great book, but it's not quite got it. It's not quite got it. The language that my wife speaks ain't in there. <laughs> the language that I speak is not in there. And I learned this through uh, the intense year that we've had this last year. Uh, but here's, here's the hope. There are some great tools beyond what you've gotten exposed to here. And this is, I'm going to end with two things. One, there are great tools available beyond personality tests and, and good but not deep enough books about how people really work. They're available. I know that they're available here. I know that they're available in good marriage counseling. I know they're good, available in good psychologists. There are great tools that are out there. And if, if you're like me, where you've been sitting here year after year after year, and you go, I get it, I get it, I get it. But it, in my life, that stuff doesn't all quite snap together and fit tight. If you're like me, and you, you want to go somewhere different than that, then I'll just be around up here this morning. I'll give you a few names. I've been through them all, brother. I'll just give you the names of the good ones and spare you all that wandering. Some fascinating stuff out there. That's one thing. So if, you, if, if, if we're getting close, but we're not quite on it, then come talk to somebody, and I'll be around. I'll give you a couple of names. Second, one of the things that, uh, that men in our culture maybe never hear and maybe don't even allow ourselves to say is, hey, you've done an excellent job. Well done. You know, God promises at the end of time that in the stewardship, you know, chapters where he writes about all this stuff, which kind of my bent. Talks about to those that have, that have been faithful. And I love the fact he didn't say to those that have been perfect. To those that have been faithful, he says, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into my 
rest. I would bet you that if we're all honest with each other, the ability to translate well done in my life, in all the relationships and all the things that we've talked about over the last year, and feeling like we enter into God's rest may be a bit of a challenge for a bunch of guys who get up at 5 o'clock on Wednesday mornings and come to these talks. I'm just betting that there's a little bit of, I could do better in most of you. I know there is in me. But you need to hear. Those of you that have come for a year, those that have come for two, those that, just, that have come for three and have stuck it out and made it from apocalypse now to apocalypse now, great job. Great job. Well done. And I know that you guys are going to, looks like you got a celebration of sorts for this, so I'll let y'all get on with it. Thanks for the time. I look forward to seeing you next year where we'll get into a lot of this stuff in a lot more detail. I promise you it'll be fun. See you. Thanks, man. Well, good morning, man. You've gotten there. You've gotten to the finish line like Scott talked about. And if it was great to see how many guys have been here all three years. And I love the guys. I've talked to some guys who have just been here since January. Guys have just been here part of the year. And you're finishing something. And we're going to talk about that this morning. But this is session 20. If you look in your workbook, we've just got a few blanks. I'm not going to be up here long this morning. So if your habit is to kind of nod off through the first 15 minutes of my talk and then sort of pay attention through the middle and then go completely asleep <laughs> again at the last 15 minutes, you're going to be sleeping for a half hour longer than normal. i got about 15 minutes up here, and then we're going to have some fun together. Well, this part of our journey is over, but what I really hope is, is what we're really at the, is, is we're at the beginning. We're at the beginning of a great adventure, and I've had some of you guys that have already done that. You've, you've started an adventure. For some of you, it's made some new friends. Frankly, I've had a couple guys say, for the first time in my life, I believe I'm getting some real friends who want to help me live out noble masculinity. We're pushing each other. We're questioning each other. We're just like Scott does so great up here, and I really appreciate it. He just, he just gets honest with each other. What a way to model that. He didn't have to do that. None of us have to do that, but if, unless we want to move forward. And so new friends is part of our adventure or we've taken steps of faith. We've already, and some of the guys have come up and they've told me, hey, I, I've taken that first step. It's still a little fuzzy out there. It's still a little, but I'm, I'm pretty sure, really sure about some early steps and I'm, I'm taking those and I've taken those and some of them have really been pretty courageous. And I just say, that's the incredible thing is you're now living, taking that first step of faith, you're now living the great adventure because the great adventure is never a destination. It's the journey and it's lived through faith. Well, this morning, if you look in your outline, this morning is all about the sword, the sword of manhood. And there's a few things that symbolize masculinity more in our culture. When we see swords, particularly great long swords like this, we think of nobility and honor and courage and strength. And those things just are embodied in this symbol. As I was researching for this talk, I, I got kind of enamored with just some of the history and the techniques involved around this particular class of sword known as the long sword. And I got this uh, diagram up here for you. I just want to tell you a little bit about these swords. There's kind of broken into two parts, the sword. There's the hilt part, kind of where the handle is, and then there's the blade part. And down on the blade, obviously you got the point and the edge, but the, the groove down the middle, if you can't see that, the kind of a concavity down the middle is known as the fuller. And I'd always been told that that was to either help let blood out of a wound when you impaled somebody, or uh, the thing I've been told most is it allowed you to extract the blade out um, of someone. And though those may be some side benefits, the reason that the fuller is there is to add strength. It's actually to build kind of an eye beam into the blade so they could lighten the blade because they're fairly heavy but to still have strength, full strength in the blade. And so that's the fuller that goes down in there. And down on the hilt end, you have the cross guard, which was at time even used to hook an opponent. Everything in here had a purpose. It evolved through life and death struggle. And those kind of things that get formed in those struggles, they get pretty efficient, they get pretty effective. And then beyond the handle, 
you've got the pommel. And we know this in our vernacular. We know the phrase to pommel someone or to pummel someone. And that comes from this because frequently someone in a battle could hit someone directly like a club with the end of the sword, or they could even use it to swing and hit with them. And they were pummeling them quite literally when they did that. And most of the time, this sword, because of its heft and being out there, most of the time it was used two-handed. Before there was armor and shields, it was almost always used this way. And the motion that was used most often before armor were slicing and cutting motions because it was very effective. But when armor came along, the slicing and cutting became almost completely ineffective because the armor worked. And so more and more of a thrusting was used and they would thrust either with two hands, one hand if you needed more reach or if you wanted more accuracy, they did a thing called half sorting where they would grab the blade and they could direct very accurately, try to get between the pieces of armor to do that. And so it was a powerful weapon to have this sword in your hand and if you knew how to use it. And that's what we're gonna talk about a little bit this morning. And if you look in your outline here, you'll see that the first point is all about that, that real manhood is a fight. And you know, we even see this um, movie clip of Apocalypse Now, and it was a clip about a horrible war, and, and war is always horrible, but we're to fight battles. Just because battles are horrible, the alternative, if you're fighting for a noble cause, if you're fighting the good fight, the alternative to the horrible part of battle is worse, much worse. And that's what Timothy, when, when Timothy's being mentored early on in the mentoring process between Paul and Timothy, Paul tells these words and just makes it real clear to him. He says, fight the good fight. And the things that you're fighting against, I would say come in three categories. The first category comes in just the whole book of lies. The things that aren't true, that, we're try that, that Satan tries to convince us that we're true. And I know for some of y'all when I even say that, you may kind of go back a little bit and go, well, how do you just jump into Satan and devil and evil and all of a sudden? Guys, I'm telling you, that's one of his biggest lies is that he doesn't exist and he's real. And he's prowling around looking to kill and steal and destroy and that's what he, what he tries to do is just lie all the time. And we have to fight battles for truth. The other kind of category of battles that we have to fight are around the world's temptations. You know, there's a lot of us that Satan doesn't even need to bother with. He doesn't need to lie to us. Doesn't need to come after us with attacks or anything like that. Doesn't need to. The world's done his job for him. The world has taken us out of the battle for God's glory through all of its temptations, its comforts, its pleasures, its distractions, its busyness, and the world's just taken us out. And we've got to fight battles against that. And then lastly, we've got to fight battles against our own selfishness, against Satan's lies, against the world's temptations, and against our own selfishness. Because when we're out saying we're fighting battles for God's glory, I mean, the greatest adventure you can live is to be a knight, a noble knight. And the reason the knights were so famous is because they were men of nobility in a dark time. And when you stand up as a noble man, I don't have to tell people we're living in a dark time. And when you stand up, you're saying, I'm standing up under the authority of the king. And that's what a noble knight does. But inside, every one of us, I can just say for myself, it comes up over and over and over again. The battle I fight is that I really want to be the king. I don't want to be under another king's authority. Even one that I know I should. And I've made a commitment to. I've made a solemn oath to. And I still have to fight that battle against wanting to be the king myself. And that comes up in selfishness, which brings up, you see on your outline, this morning we're going to have three thrusts of the sword. I said the, the real deadly part of this sword, even against armor, was the thrust, the impaling of your opponent. And the first one that we have to do is the inward thrust of the sword, which is what I was just talking about. And in that, we first have to take on passivity, 
It's a powerful enemy passivity that goes all the way back to Adam in the Garden of Eden. Our ancestor, Adam, just sat there. And the first point in our definition of manhood, remember, is reject passivity? That's because Adam, he's sitting there and he's got that moment. He's got the ability to kind of fight that first masculine battle. And he didn't. He took a pass. He didn't even run away. He just stood there. And in that regard, we are all chips off the old block. We have to fight that all the time. The second inward thrust of the sword is against doubt, against passivity and against doubt. Do I have what it takes is that first question of doubt. We talked about that last week when we looked at the moments before. And there's that doubt. And here's what I'd say. Now, you guys, you know, Russell gives the rah-rah thing, so I'm sure he's going to go up there and you have what it takes. Let me tell you the truth. Listen to me. You don't have what it takes. You don't. You'll never win this battle on your own. You're going to need some other noble knights to fight with you. And then beyond that, you're going to need a divine partnership because you're never going to win this battle without God's help. You may have some success by some worldly standards, but you will never live the noble life and the great adventure that you're longing to live. You guys have gotten up for 20 weeks at early hours of the morning, and you haven't done that because you want to be successful. You've done that because you want to be noble and adventurous. There's easier ways to be successful. This great scripture here, I love this one. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. That one's kind of become a real personal one for me. I even use that at time when I'm, you know, working out or I'm pushing things hard and I'm just I'm feeling the pain and I don't want to even continue. And I just keep digging back to that one. It's meaningful to me because I watch a guy live this scripture out in 1996. Look at this picture. Vander Holyfield putting the wood to Mike Tyson in their first fight. You guys remember that? Do you remember what was on his robe <laughs> embroidered very broad? The only thing on this, this clean white robe he had, Philippians 4.13. And on his trunks, and look at his trunks, what does it say on there? Warrior. He knew that, and he knew he was taking on an opponent that was bigger than him in all respects as far as being able to defeat him. And he knew he was going to need help. And I remember we were at a friend's house and we'd kind of all chipped in to do the pay-per-view thing and we're going to watch this. And he had that on there. And somebody said, well, I wonder what that is. And I'm not really good at memorizing Scripture. And, and so he dug out his Bible and he looked it up. And that day it got etched in my mind. And I remember this one really well because we, he read it out loud. and went, man, that's really good. He's looking for some help. And we thought that was almost a desperate move and to say, I'm going to lose. But for him it was strength. And he got it done, if you watch that fight, and shocked the world. He knew he needed Jesus Christ. The second doubt that you have to conquer besides do I have what it takes is what do I believe? What do I really believe? Because out of belief comes conviction, and out of conviction comes action. And if we don't have action, all of this is just, frankly, a wasteful exercise. So it's conviction. And I'd ask, have you really decided what you believe about your identity, about your purpose, and about your destiny? Because, listen, look at me, guys. Look at me. Just for a second. Everybody just look at me for a second. No man can leave those questions unanswered and expect to live a great adventure. There's not a second best first step. You've got to wrestle what you believe to the ground. A real man presses himself for those answers. And it's not easy. It's never easy. Scott told you how long he's been working on it. And I know him. And he's, every single time he's done that, he's pressed himself for answers. But he finds that he has to keep coming back and peeling away new layers and new learning and gaining new strength and new awarenesses and new powers to change this world. Because not figuring it out is not good enough. Hebrews tells us, 
around this area of belief because it's going to take faith. I, I love what Robert Lewis says. This is one of my favorite lines when I get with people, especially persisters and, and folks in that area who really, they don't want any doubt. They don't like the idea of doubt. I'm just telling you guys, we live in a faith world. And because we live in a faith world, we have to have doubt. No doubt, no faith. It's just the nature of it. Otherwise, it's just knowledge if there's no doubt. And I love what Robert says about God and the evidence that he gives us. He says, God gives us enough evidence to inspire faith, but not so much evidence as to eliminate it. There will be a day at the end where there's not going to take faith. We're going to step into the reality of eternity and go, oh, this is the way it is. I don't need anybody to give me evidence. It's plain in front of me. And Hebrews talks about how powerful faith is. Says, and without faith, it is impossible to please him. <clears throat> All the great things you could try to do, believing that this is something for God's glory, God's pleasure, none of it's any good. It's impossible if it doesn't have faith. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. Next, after the inward thrust of the sword is the forward thrust of the sword. This is an advance. This is a charge. We've had those moments before inward and now we're heading out. And the first we got to do is to conquer the strongholds in your life. You know, when the nation of Israel moved into the promised land, and if you look at the real estate and the amount of people that came over and have been over there, there were a lot of places they could have gone and not fought battles. There was a lot of open, air, open land around, but that's not what they did because they were there to possess the land. And they knew they had to go, go, had to go and take on the strongholds, the cities, the fortified cities, the giants, the high ground, and that's what they did. And we've got to do the same thing. We've got to look and to conquer the strongholds of our lives. So what is it? What are the battles that we need to fight first? Don't go find open space and say, well, I'll just get comfortable here and then I'll fight these battles. You need to take the fortified cities first. What is it? Is it, is it a job rearrangement, job change, something around your job you need to take that on first? Take it on. Is it your marriage? Take it on. Is it an addiction? That's your battle to take on first because a real man looks at the strongholds that are holding him back and says, enough. Next is to acquire a clear vision for your life. You know, I told you earlier about Satan's lies and, and uh, C.S. Lewis did so many brilliant things. And one of the most brilliant was this little book he wrote called The Screwtape Letters. And in it, there's Satan who's named Screwtape and one of his minions, one of his protégés named Wormwood. And the, the thing's kind of a coaching, mentoring kind of deal where uh, um, Screwtape is telling Wormwood how to deceive the people and get them to fall and come over to him. And here's one of the lines. He calls the people he's trying to deceive the patient. And he, so he writes this letter to Wormwood. He says, keep your patient firmly attentive to the immediate of life. Teach him to call it real life and don't let him ask what it means to be real. He's trying, telling him to get us to focus on the now. And focusing on the now never pulls you forward. And now, do, all now does is keep us confused and busy. Because a real man, a real man carves out a clear vision for his life that goes way beyond the now. He's gone out there and he's decided the vision for his life so that in the now, we have to live in the now. But we're making decisions in the now because we have a vision for where we're going. We've got a vision of the end in mind. Proverbs tells us the life and death power of vision. Where there is no vision, men perish. And this year, 
We've helped you with some navigational tools along the way. We've had this life compass. You guys remember that? We've worked on that. We're still working on that. If you need another one of these pocket versions, get another one of the pocket versions. We've worked on a wiring diagram, and that's been a, a navigational tool for some of you guys to go in and, and find out where those short, short circuits are. Or Tim did a great job of taking us through your unique design, and it became, through that process of doing my mission statement, come to my word, for me, having gone through this several times, it became a very powerful navigational tool that helped me to see more clearly the vision for this season of my life right here. I need those tools. So lastly then, is to persevere and take new ground with your life. There's power in perseverance, and it's way beyond just gutting it out and taking one for the team. Okay, because it just seems kind of like that's what it is. We're just calling you to tough it out. Look at these three scriptures here. Just walk through real quick with these. The power of, of perseverance. It says first in Romans, says, we also exalt in our tribulations. Tribulations, just problems. Remember I've told you, problems aren't the problem. We've all got problems. In fact, it's actually telling us that problems are gonna, a good thing. It's how we deal with those problems that determine if they're a problem or a solution. Knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance and perseverance proven character and proven character hope and hope does not disappoint. Remember what we said? We want at the end of our life to be satisfied, to not at the end of our life be disappointed. And that begins, the root of that, the Scripture's telling us, is through perseverance. There's a reason for it beyond just, I'm going to tough it out. And James tells us that. It says, blessed is a man who perseveres under trial. There's going to be blessing through that. And then Revelation talks about just the growing influence that we have. It says, I know your deeds and your love and faith and service and perseverance, and that your deeds of late are greater than that at first. Because of your persevering, you're able to take on more and more and more adventure more life because you've persevered. Well, lastly, so there's the inward thrust and the forward thrust. Lastly, the end of a battle, there's the upward thrust of the sword. A place where we can celebrate success. We can mark moments in this life, like we're going to do here in just the next couple of minutes. We're going to mark the end of this journey together. It's not the end of all our journeys together, but this particular moment we're going to celebrate. Some of you guys I've talked to, and you've come up and you said, I lost 50 pounds. That's a celebration. I got real about my marriage, and I got into counseling. I've had several of you guys come up and tell me that. You were tired of that finally holding you back, and it's a celebration. I got that job. I knew the job that I needed to have, and it wasn't far from where I was, but I took the courage, and I did the work, and I got the job. Yes, it's time to celebrate. There are moments we need to celebrate in life. Or I reconciled with my dad. Or I reconciled with my son. And now we love being together. We're still figuring out what a real relationship is together. But we're celebrating because we're on that journey together. And then lastly, <clears throat> the upward thrust of the sword is to celebrate a life well lived with the expectation of more to come. If you follow how Paul mentors Timothy through 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy, he moves kind of from fight the good fight to later in 2 Timothy, he's talking about kind of a different battle and, and, and where we are in that whole journey. He says this in 2 Timothy. He says, I have fought the good fight. So now he's going to talk to him about the fruit of that. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. In the future, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord of the righteous judge will award to me on that day. And not only to me, this just drove Paul, because he knew what was waiting for him, but he wanted it for the rest of us too. And he says, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved His appearing. Those that have believed that the end is going to be a glorious day 
Because, they take, because they've taken Jesus Christ on his offer that the end will be a glorious day. Those are the ones who are going to love his appearing because they're expecting a greater reward. So here we are. We're at the end of this year's journey. And what I want more than anything, as I said at the end of the very first talk, that I want us at the end of our lives to be like Abraham. You know, he had an incredible journey. He started out life, successful business guy. He's got everything going for him. God says, yeah, that's pretty impressive. Now, chuck all that. Head on a road. Somewhere along the way, I'll just kind of show you where we're going together to this promised land. And it's going to be great, and you're going to love it. And Abram did that. And along the way became Abraham. And just I love what Scott said. It's not about perfection. It's about faith. As a faithful man, he made a lot of mistakes, but he continued to be faithful along the way. So that at the end of his life, he was able to sit there and say, I am satisfied. And that's still what I want for you guys more than anything. And to mark the end of our time here this year, you know, I've had kind of a mountaineering thing. You guys have have hung in there through some of my climbing stories. And, and, and I love the guys that come up and go, I hate climbing. I just hate even thinking about climbing. Okay. But you've endured the story, so I appreciate that. Let me tell you what you do get at the top of a climb that's really one of the great things. You get to the top, and one of the things you want to see, especially if you're an achiever, you want to see the summit marker. And this is a, a true replica of a summit marker. This one actually is a replica of the one that sits on top of the Grand Teton out in Wyoming. And when you get to the top of the mountain, you want to see that benchmark, that summit marker that's up there. Because it tells you, it gives you confirmation of where you are and what you've done for that particular moment. And we wanted to do the exact same thing. So I found, we found one of the companies that makes these for the United States Geological Survey, who places most of these in the United States. And we commissioned them to do a special summit medallion made into a key ring. And it says on there, Men's Fraternity, The Adventure. It's got the little triangle with the dot in the middle that's representative of the summit that's on there. And it says 2010. And then it says the words that we're going to finish through as you come up and graduate and shake my hand here this morning. It says, take the land. And then it says, take the high ground. And that's what I want for you guys here this morning. It's been an incredible honor to be here, to have y'all keep coming back. I've had to grow probably more this year in this few months than I've ever done in such a short amount of time. I've never done anything like this before. And, and there's parts of this I love. There's parts of this I hate. What I love is how much of the adventure I got to live through you guys. Thanks. Tim? Hey, as we finish out this morning, we want to do exactly what Russell talked about. We want to celebrate together, celebrate everybody here and have the opportunity. We do this at the end of every men's fraternity, a graduation. And, and it really is. It's, it's that opportunity for us as a team to be able to say thank you to you and to celebrate with you and say way to go with you. And to do that, uh, just a few things as, as we finish out. We, we'll get out of here plenty of time. You, you don't need to stress out about that. Uh, what I would say is we want you to finish with us and then join us next year. Scott referenced it a little bit. Next year we're going to do something a little different. We're going to step away from the curriculum. We've been on a three-year journey. We're going to step away for a year. We've got a team of teachers, and we're just going to talk about stuff. Just gives us a year to take some of the topics over the last three years and drill a little bit deeper, kind of unpack a little bit of our lives as a team of teachers, and Scott, as he referenced, he's going to do more than host next year. He's going to actually be on that teaching team with us. Take a few weeks and, and really process some of the material he was talking about with you this morning. I think you'll enjoy being a part of that. I'm going to be on the team. We've got some of the other teachers around here who will be a part of it. I think it's a great rally year, uh, especially if you've been a guy, you've been through the, the three-year maybe curriculum several times. It's a great way for us to rally again together and just talk about the real stuff of life that every man faces and, and so we want you to be a part. We'll let you know more about it. We'll send you an email to, to update you with that. But I want to invite you to be a part of it next year. As we finish out this year, a few things that we need to do. One, you need to realize it's more than just Russell and me. You see us up on the stage. You see Scott. There are a team of guys, the black shirts, 
who have, have been a part of serving, and most of them have served every year. And guys, they are here early. They open up. They make sure we have the coffee. They make sure we get donuts. They run our technical crew, and so they're here on Tuesday afternoons, and they're running through all that stuff. And, and I want to tell you, we wouldn't have men's fraternity if it wasn't for those guys. They want to be a part of that graduation as well. They want to look you in the eye and thank you. And so as we do graduation, what we're going to do in just a moment, I have all the black shirts, everybody that's been a part of serving, come up on the stage with me. We'll be up here. Russell wants to greet you first and, and be able to give you that medallion and, and look you in the eye. And it's taking the high ground, take the high country. And, and so you, you have that opportunity. But then we want you to run the gauntlet with all of us so we can high five you and say way to go with that as a team. We, we won't call names or anything when, when it's time for graduation. We'll all come up here. We'll be here. And I'll just ask the guys on this side of the room, you start it first and we'll go across the stage. Here's what I'm going to ask, though. Stick around. Don't graduate and then leave so that these guys over here are in an empty room uh, with it. The other thing we want to do is as we process through, everybody's had the opportunity to be a part. We want to call you all back up so we can get one last group shot. Uh, you know, this is the, the only time this group of guys have, we've reached the summit together. Let's take a group shot at the summit together. And so th that'll go pretty quick. If you've got to get to work, you've got a bolt and you're sitting over there, come right on up. You don't have to wait in line. This, this isn't about that. I mean, it's sword warrior mentality. Just do what you need to do. Get, get in there. So uh, we don't need to worry about that. But uh, to lead into graduation, I want to ask first all the black shirts to come forward, all the guys that have been serving in different capacities, all the different ones. Come on, I see some of them out there they don't like. Come on, Mark. Come on, different ones. All the guys who've been serving, been a part, been on the team. Yeah, th these are the men that make it happen. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm aware. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, Russell this year stepped up in a new capacity. As we led into this year, and Russell really felt called to teach it, and really, as I look over the last year, there's nobody that could have taught this material better. Man, he, he is a guide, he is a leader, and he has poured his life into us. But you may not realize, more than just teaching this year, Russell has been the team catalyst. You can ask all the guys up here, over the last three years, it's been Russell who has just led the way, been at the forefront, and... Uh, we are excited about that next step you're taking to Africa, but a little sad. It, it, it's going to be weird to do men's fraternity without you. It just won't be the same. So we're figuring out how we can Skype or figure out maybe you can have Russell part of the teaching team next year, even from Africa. But before you left, we wanted to say thanks to you. And as a team, we chipped in. We have a, a present for you. Russell, why don't you come on up? <laughs> We've got that for you. Yeah, it's not a bomb. Maybe you should open it. Yeah, yeah. You want, you want me to open it for you? Yeah, go ahead and open it. Okay, yeah. I, that. Ah, sling box. Sling box. This is a... The ball games in Africa. Yeah, it, it, this is designed, you can hook it. It's hooked to a TV here, and any program can be sent to a computer anywhere around the world. So he can watch the Razorbacks and Oprah and all the other things I know that you love to... <laughs> Love to watch and don't want to miss. I got this. Yeah. That's and awesome. so, thanks yeah, well, it's our way of just saying thanks to you and thanks for leading us in there. Well, thanks. We, we appreciate you more than we can say and more than a gift can show, but just thanks for leading us these last three years and thanks for being a partner with us in all of this. So, that's been fun. Yeah. Really fun. Well, hey, as we kick off uh, graduation here, it, it's real simple. We're, we're laid back. Let's just start in this side of the room. I want to encourage you, come on up. You come up these stairs, greet Russell first. All of us on the team want to say high five and tell you, tell you way to go. And then, uh, then as you sit back down, after we finish the last of the group, we'll call everybody back up for a group picture.